Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have another great evening for you, a great guest, John Ramirez. He was on, I think, over a year ago and uh, was one of the uh, highest listened to or highest downloaded shows. So I'm excited to bring him back and talk to him about what he's, you know, what's occurred since uh, he's been out there talking a little bit here and there about it. He was out in Phoenix. I was really looking looking forward to meeting him, but of course that uh, was canceled for me. I didn't make it out there, but it's a pleasure to have him back on. Uh, no blog this week. Charles Lear, the blogger, will be on our show next week. He did a five-part series, and uh, he's going to be talking about that. And uh, and the week after that, we have Avi Loeb is uh, back on the show as well. So that's what we have going on. Anyone can support the show. Um, all you have to do is go over to podcastufo.com. And uh, the support of the show is on the top menu. And uh, anyone can do that for just a couple of dollars or more a month. And greatly appreciated. We appreciate everyone that listens to the show, everyone that watches the show. You know, I was looking uh, recently the other day, and there's 2.4 million podcasts. It seems like they have grown like crazy since COVID happened. Um, I think when I started this, it was, I want to say uh, it was under a million back uh, over 11 years ago. Uh, but uh, it's really grown uh, really a big time. So what I'm getting at is I really do, you have a lot of choices and I really do uh, appreciate the fact that you are watching and listening. And for those of you who support the show, I really do appreciate that as well. So it's time to bring in our guest. Welcome back, John. Uh, Martin, thanks for having me back on Podcast UFO. It has been a long time. And I yeah. truly wanted to speak with you in person uh, back at the International UFO Congress that was held in October. Right. I heard that went really well for you. Uh, I, I enjoyed I, it yeah. very much. Yes. Yeah. I spoke with Alejandro about it afterwards. He said he was very pleased with your talk. So I and I want to touch a little bit on that. But first of all, for the person that didn't catch uh, uh, you on the show last time, if you would just kind of go into a nutshell of your background. And uh, I know you're in the Navy back in the 70s, and then you got into uh, intelligence, I believe it was, was it 1984 to 2009, the CIA. And uh, so if you would just give your, your background, and then I'd like to jump right into uh, what's going on um, since we last spoke. Uh, sure, Martin. Uh, when I was in the Navy in the 70s, I was in a field called electronic warfare, and that job was primarily to defend the ship. Uh, using uh, electronic jammers and other techniques that we had, such as chaff rockets, as well as collect and intercept signals from our adversary ships that might be out, out there and identify them as either threat or non-threat. And that led to a career in the similar field at CIA, where I was a SIGINT officer for the Central Intelligence Agency. So we think of NSA as being the SIGIN agency, and they are the primary SIGIN agency, but CIA has a very capable uh, SIGIN capability uh, ourselves in the service of uh, certain of our own operations. Technical collection operations uh, was a field that I was in uh, for CIA, as well as the analysis of, uh, for lack of a better term, threatening radars from our adversaries, primarily uh, Russian. And uh, so that led to um, some exposure with how the Russians were reacting with their radars toward what we would today call UAPs. And so they had radars that were able to uh, detect these objects out in space. And uh, because of their interest, um, then we became interested in what the Russians were seeing and how they were evaluating these objects. So I didn't know too much about uh, what we did in the country because uh, CIA is prohibited from collecting intelligence in the country. Uh, that's for other departments and agencies of the government, such as the FBI or now uh, Department of Homeland Security, but we're primarily a foreign intelligence agency. And so we did know that the Russians were very interested in the UAP topic and used their uh, sensors to collect against them. And that's how I got into um, the entire field. But I never had any kind of uh, NDAs related specifically to UFOs 
I did not know about the exploitation of these UFOs that may have occurred. Uh, but later on, uh, but just putting pieces together from FOIA, I was able to read not only between the lines, but behind the lines. And I was able to surmise, I think, rather accurately of what was going on during that time. Here. Interesting. Uh, we have a, a, a having a little bit of an internet issue. I apologize, but uh, so I can't tell <laughs> when you stop talking right there. But uh, so uh, last time you were on, uh, you had mentioned that um, you were looking for medical records, and I just wondered if those ever came in. Were you ever able to verify anything? No, uh, I would not receive those records personally. Uh, CIA considers our medical records to be CIA property. However, what I did was submit a letter to the Information and Privacy Coordinator at CIA and requested that the CIA send those records to a physician. And I would not see them, but the physician would see them. And so that's what I did. And I don't know if that particular physician has received those records. It was not my personal physician. It was one recognized by the ODNI as having clearances. And so I needed to use a physician with clearances with the ODNI in order to receive those records for him to receive it. I don't know if, if that particular physician has received anything. I suspect that he has. Well, this is a, this is such a strange thing to me, why you can't actually observe your own medical records and i'm i'm trying to understand the logic of it uh what is the security issue logic to that well the medical records will also contain uh places i've been uh on behalf of cia in foreign in the foreign field and that i may have been inoculated for certain types of diseases bacteria viruses whatever uh, in that particular region. So when you look at my medical record, you can put together where I, as a CIA officer, might have served under a different identity, a different name, a completely different identity uh, in order to conduct a, an operation for CIA. So if you look at the records, it tells you where I went to and what inoculations I may have had. If I had any kind of uh, a medical issue in the field, it will list, you know, where I was and what that particular issue might have been. So you can reconstruct a CIA officer's entire overseas background from the medical record. And that is why it's considered CIA property. And uh, I would also add that I have no access to my security file as well, or my personnel file, which is classified for 75 years after I retired. So add 75 <laughs> to 2009, and uh, that's the year uh, that I would that if I'm I won't be alive. <laughs> so that's the year that somebody can FOIA my uh, my uh, uh, my files at that time. Wow. Well, so uh, yeah, I I totally I I do get I do understand that. So what were you? Ho I can't remember what you were hoping to find in your medical records. If if you could have someone look at them for you? Uh, it was the incident I had with nosebleeds. I I was bleeding oh. a lot from my right nostril uh, ever since I was a child. I always had this, this bleeding issue where it would just bleed for no reason whatsoever. Um, and it sort of subsided um, in early adulthood. But when I was um, in my 40s, uh, it came back up again at night. And it would happen like between three and four o'clock. And the interesting part is that uh, the bleeding was associated with a memory of having visitors in my bedroom. So something caused my nose to bleed. Mm. Coincidentally, um, I had a memory, whether it's a dream or an actual occurrence of visitors in my bedroom who are not human. And so I had this nosebleed at work. And uh, it was, I think the year was 2000 and I had this nosebleed and I uh, grabbed uh, a box of tissues, uh, the seat rolled back. It's an office chair 
with wheels. It rolled back and I landed on my back and my coworkers called the Office of Medical Services and security and they escorted me up to the Office of Medical Services for examination. And that's where I learned that they said, oh, by the way, did you know that, have you ever had any surgery in your uh, right nostril? And I said, no. Well, there's a precise surgical cup very deep in your right nostril and we can see it. And this doctor called another doctor and said, look at this. And he said, oh, wow, you know, and they had a sidebar discussion uh, and I don't know what they were talking about. They came back and said, well, we can fix it. Oh, by the way, we want to remove something in that area. Uh, will you allow us to remove it? I said, sure, go ahead and remove it. So they removed some tissue. Maybe there was just cleaning the area. And then they proceeded to uh, do a cauterization of that particular uh, surgical site. And I didn't have any problems after that. And so I was wondering, uh, what did they remove? Uh, was it an implant, for example? Uh, because I remember having these nosebleeds coincident with visitors. And so I was hoping that maybe uh, the medical file might give me more detail about exactly what did they find and if they took the sample and did any kind of analysis, what was uh, what were the results of the analysis? Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Now, when you were on before, you said that you were going to talk about um, visitors, but on another podcast, you, I guess you had promised them it was going to be like an exclusive at the time. Um, are you able to talk more about that? Um, and these, I think, were childhood issues that you had, right? Uh, yes. Um, I wouldn't call it an issue um, because well, when I'm you're sorry. a child, yeah, yeah you, you don't know it's an issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I would say this. Um, a lot of parents have children who talk about imaginary playmates. And I would submit that those playmates may not be that imaginary at all. Because when I was small, I had similar types of experiences, uh, not necessarily with playmates, but I remember um, being led to a house and by a woman who was not my mother and walking through the front door. And it's like a Victorian A-frame house with a turret on the left side, wraparound porch. And I went in and immediately to the left, it was a doctor's office. I was greeted by a nurse and a doctor and they wore like very old, uh, like historical medical garb. Uh, I would say like Victorian type of garb. And I looked around and it was like Victorian type of instruments. And uh, they examined me, they undressed me and they examined me. And then they dressed me and this woman would lead me back out again. And then I would have a memory of waking up. And this was a recurring type of experience. Um, and so I don't know if it was just a dream or if it was a cover memory of something else that may have occurred. Um, I don't know, but my mother tells me that I've never had any type of doctor's visit like that. And she would be there, of course. My parents would be there if their child was being examined by a doctor. Naturally, the parents would be there. But my parents were not accompanying me in any of these visits that have occurred. And there were more than one, at least like two or three of these types of visits sometimes on the ground floor and sometimes on the second floor of this particular house. And, uh, wow. And so your mother had no idea this was going on. No, whatsoever. No, she says you've never been, you never been to a doctor like that. <laughs> and, uh, do you remember it being far away from where you were? I don't know if there's any sense of distance. Uh, I just do know that, uh, at the time, I lived in the town of Petersburg, Virginia, which is about 25 miles south of Richmond, Virginia, on uh, US Route 1. And so directly 25 miles south is the town of Petersburg. And at that time, they had uh, many antebellum homes, uh, homes built after the Civil War and in the early Victorian, early 1900s period that looked like those types of houses that I saw. And so perhaps it was like a cover memory for me that I would like recognize that type of house. Uh, wow. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. And I would go on. Um, 
another experience I had was uh, being in a uh, department store, a five and dime, as we called them back then, and seeing a book that I opened up. And on the lower left corner of the book was a uh, diagram or a drawing of two humans that were like primitive humans, like cave dwelling humans lifting up a baby and above the baby was a sa two saucers one of them shining a light on the woman who lifted up this baby and the message there was that um uh, this is where you came from we made you this is who you are and i asked my mother to um buy the book i went and got her and it was no more than not even a minute and the book disappeared where i laid it uh laid it down to uh have it purchased so I couldn't find the book at all, but I clearly remember that drawing. John, I'm going to come in. I think that he has some technical issues. Uh, Mark yeah. Some technical issues. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of the questions that are comments that are coming in from the chat room. Sure. Um, it says here that, well, you already mentioned how old you were when this happened, correct? Uh, I was a, about six years old. Yeah. And someone else mentions, I wonder how this relates to Jacques Vallée's control hypothesis. If you have any opinion of that. I don't know what I, I am probably the worst read person in ufology. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Actually, I don't read a lot of ufology books because for me, I experienced the phenomenon and I don't need to read a book to explain it to me. I, I know what I've experienced. So I don't know what that that means. If you could explain it to me, I can respond. I'm actually not familiar. It was just a comment that came in. But I do want to ask you because uh, a few days ago, they came out with a proposal, a fiscal budget for the UAP underwater uh, mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. And I saw a number of 650 million. And one of the things that caught my attention in this document is the protection for whistleblowers that are possibly working for uh, intelligence agencies or contractors and giving them, I guess, more protection of being able to come forward without retribution from within the intelligence committee or contractors. Have you heard anything? Are you familiar with any of that? And what would your opinion be of that? I, I, I'm not familiar with the Navy's budget requests for UAP research, so that's news to me. Uh, I can say that the overall intelligence budget that is um, from the Title 50 side, that is the civilian intelligence budget controlled by the Office Director of National Intelligence, um, it's unclassified that it's like $90 billion dollars. And on the military intelligence side, it's much less than that. It's, um, well, actually, I, I misspoke. The entire budget is about 90 billion, and about uh, 60 billion goes to the civilian side, and 30 billion goes to the military side. This isn't the defense budget, this is the defense intelligence budget. Um, so, out of that, perhaps um, there is money set aside for the Navy. Um, as far as whistleblowers go, the Whistleblower Protection Act has been on the books for quite some time. It's nothing new. Right. What they wanted to do is enhance the ability for whistleblowers to come forward so that they can redress their grievances more effectively and so they not be ignored. So now it sets time limits that uh, it's not that uh, a whistleblower can come on um, podcast UFO and spill all the beans. It, it doesn't allow for that. What it does allow for is that the whistleblower can go to his or her own uh, management. And if the management does not uh, address the issue, then that whistleblower can go to the inspector general of his or her department or agency. And if the inspector general does not satisfy the whistleblower in addressing the grievance, then the whistleblower is actually free to go directly to Congress. And the directly to Congress didn't exist before. We were prohibited from contacting members of Congress. We would have to go through the Office of Legislative Affairs or Congressional Affairs in each of our uh, respective agencies uh, and departments. But now the whistleblower can go straight to Congress 
and report something that um, might deal with not necessarily UAPs, but just a waste of money, um, corruption, you name it, um, that can be brought up to Congress. John, I think the problem is that it's bipartisan. I truly believe there is a bipartisan congressional opinion that they want information from the agencies. Mm -hmm. And the agencies are reluctant to give them anything. They, it seems even classified in a classified setting, it seems like they're reluctant to give it to anyone involved with Congress. And I don't know if this has to do with leaks um, or looking at them in a certain way, but this could be an, a way for those individuals, like you just mentioned, to approach Congress directly to come forward because they're not getting they're not getting the information that they want mm -hmm. from the agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Whistleblower Protection Act doesn't necessarily uh, address the NDA issue. That's in a separate part of the uh, Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 23. Uh, it does address the NDA issue. Uh, but there is, I wouldn't call it a loophole, maybe I should. But um, what it allows is for people with information regarding UAPs of non-human origin that those NDAs, are for lack of a better term, null and void, mm. that they're now able to come forward with information about UAPs that are truly non-human, non-terrestrial in origin, without retribution. And then that aligned with the Whistleblower Protection Act, that's like a like a two-fisted punch, you know, a little bit more strength for those individuals. I count myself as one of those individuals. I'm sitting on something that I think people should know that has nothing to do with anything the Air Force or any service of the Department of Defense may have uh, derived the technology from a UAP and adapted it for human use. It may be squirreled away in a hangar or under the ground or whatever, under the sea. Um, it's the legislation still protects those types of vehicles. So you're not going to get people coming out and saying, oh, we have a reproduction vehicle squirreled away in the Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen because the law says, as it is written, that uh, that's still protected. But what is not protected is the source of that technology. You know, where is the original craft? And where did you derive that technology from? That's non-human technology. And that is what uh, the legislation addresses. I, I still am very speculative that they would even use the term extraterrestrial, interdimensional. Uh, right now, it seems everything is adversarial, and they seem to come up with explanations. Oh, these yeah. are these drones. Are, are you optimistic that they're actually going to come forward, individuals, to claim that they're extraterrestrial in nature? Well, inside inside uh, these agencies and departments. Um, uh, the fact that they are of off-world origin or maybe on-world origin, they're, they're hiding somewhere, uh, that's not unusual to consider. Uh, what you're hearing, I believe, what we've heard were, um, I wouldn't call them leaks necessarily. I call them, um, I would call them like pre-dissemination information uh, yeah. that uh, in order to deflect the narrative from the rest of us civilians, I no longer have clearances and I'm longer in CIA. So I count myself as a civilian uh, in order to deflect the conversation, the narrative that they're saying these things just to dispel any excitement, any kind of like anticipation that may, that may have accrued over this upcoming UAP report, the second one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to say, yeah, most of them were Chinese drones. I think that's disingenuous of the source, perhaps from within the Pentagon, that allow certain news outlets to hear that information. I think a lot of individuals that are out there, that whether it's civilian or military or in, in the, the alphabet agencies, they're afraid to come forward. Because I'm seeing a lot of the comments in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. And they're just in fear of their losing their careers, mm -hmm. being threatened. Yeah. I mean, if you look at and I was laughing at when the FAA said they were going to look at this people that and I've known pilots in the past that have told yeah. me that they witnessed something, but they're afraid to say anything due to their careers and their jobs because 
they'll, they'll be sent for a psyche val immediately. Right. You know, they don't want to risk their career, their livelihoods, and what affects their families. It's very difficult for a person to come forward, regardless how much you protect them, because there's always going to be a way to target that person and make life miserable for that whistleblower to come Right. Out. So what needs to happen, I believe, is um, people above my pay grade who have the information to come forward themselves. And I'm talking about um, former secretaries of defense, uh, former directors of these various agencies uh, that had the UAP portfolio, uh, UFO portfolio from day one um, to come forward and lead the way for everyone else. If they will come forward and said, this is what I know about this phenomenon and do it under oath before a congressional committee that serves as the role model for everyone else. If you get a former director of CIA coming forward under oath saying, I know that these vehicles are not from this planet. I know that there are non-human intelligences involved with the presence of these vehicles. And I know that the US government has had contact with these non-human intelligences going back to the 1950s. And saying that under oath, I mean, that right there is a watershed moment. That is a Pandora's box. It's, it's That needs to happen. Now, whether that will happen, my guess, as good as your guess, I don't know. But I'm hoping that that is what would happen. Because having a GS-15, like me, or GG-15, um, the Department of Defense uses GG versus GS. GG-15, Lou Elizondo or even uh, Jim Simivan, who was in a senior exec, uh, senior intelligence services, uh, even at that level, you actually need somebody who headed an agency, headed a department to do the same. Because we can be on podcasts every every minute of the day forever, and you know it, it doesn't break the ice, really. It really doesn't, but you need somebody with that authority to say so. Right. Well, let's see if Martin is back. Martin, are you back I with I, I am I am back. Uh, I had them ping my whatever you call it, the router or whatever. And uh, I, I'm just having really low up speed, uh, upload speed. So I just shut my camera off, uh, which is good for you because it shows your logo, Bill. So, <laughs> All right, gentlemen, enjoy and have a great. Well, yeah, show. keep your keep your ear to this. And hopefully I'll be able to stay in. So uh, I don't know what I missed, John, but uh, it was interesting when I came back. Thank you, Bill. Um, John, I remember you mentioned that you saw, you witnessed on some satellite um, I, or, or a group of satellites, these orange orbs oh. flying in formation and right almost like under intelligent control at, at some point. This was something that you, in, in your job, because, right? I mean, this had to do with what you were doing. Yeah, uh, there are two parts of the story. One occurred in the uh, 90s uh, when uh, the Russian ballistic missile early warning system detected objects uh, that excited them to the point that they raised the readiness of their strategic rocket forces. And because they raised the readiness of the strategic rocket forces, naturally that cued us as to a situation where we needed to observe what they were doing because basically they were ready to launch at that point or getting ready to launch not perhaps pre preparations to launch because of what they saw in their radars uh the wow. objects they saw um, were not satellites they ruled out satellites and they eventually ruled out a ballistic missile attack from the united states because um, they too have infrared sensors that watch for launches from the continental United States, from the oceans of the submarine launch ballistic missiles. And they knew that we didn't launch anything, but yet here comes a bunch of objects flying in their space that they mm. could detect. Um, and so that raised their awareness level, which uh, then I was responsible for uh, writing up a memorandum for the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time, who was John Deutsch. And so my colleague and I, uh, both worked on this and we delivered, um, I was the principal author and we delivered the uh, memorandum to John Deutsch's briefer. Of course, these principals, they get briefed every morning as to what happened 
uh, within the last 24 hours, and they are have an opportunity to ask questions of the briefer. The briefer will come back to the agency and then queue up the subject matter experts on whatever the question might deal with. In this case, it was the ballistic missile early warning system and what they detected. And so I was able to deliver that memorandum to John Deutsch. Uh, that was one part. The second part was um, years later, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we detected from uh, certain electro-optical sensors uh, the presence of these orbs flying over Russia. Now, at that point, the first thing you do is rule out the obvious. Uh, do the Russians have a type of aerospace vehicle with the capabilities that our sensors detected? And so what we did, uh, my, my branch, uh, we were uh, analysts of uh, very advanced Russian aircraft systems. Mm -hmm. And some of these aircraft systems carried something called plasma stealth generators that could actually create a plasma field around that aircraft as it's flying in order to hide itself from our radars. Wow. So they had that technology. Um, and so we ruled out that it was plasma stealth generators. And uh, I would say that, you know, at that point, um, ruling that out, uh, it then went to other agencies to rule out what they thought it might be. And it was necessary then to convene a working group of what we call the interagency working group. And for us, it would be like the big five sisters uh, NSA, CIA, DIA, NRO, NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Authority, uh, to convene together along with our contractors um, and to meet on this as to determine what was it that we saw now, in Russian when this, space. Mm -hmm. When this happened, and you know, I do apologize for the uh, issues here, not being able to be up there on camera, uh, but when this happened, did you... Uh, would the United States or s some uh, organization um, in the that you would contact actually contact the Russians and say something like uh, we are we have no idea what these we realize these aren't yours they they aren't ours uh, we have no idea what they are I mean is there any type of work like that or is that all just uh, like because of the Cold War nobody talked to anybody Well, this was after the Cold War. This isn't the Soviet era. Uh, what I described before in terms of radars uh, being able to detect these objects, uh, that was during uh, the Russian Federation period of the 90s. So the Cold War I was see. over. Yeah. And this was also um, in the early 2000s. So there was no Cold War. It was over. Uh, as to answer your question, we do have uh, conversations with the Russians of a technical nature, particularly because of, of treaty monitoring of treaty compliance, that uh, when they launch ballistic missiles to test the ballistic missiles, they tell us that they're launching ballistic missiles. They tell us the time frame and actually gives us a chance to queue up our sensors so that we can collect against those ballistic missiles. And we do the same. We tell the Russians we're launching a Minuteman 3 from Vandenberg uh, uh, base and it's going to land in Kwajalein Atoll. And so they are queued up that we are also conducting tests. This is to prevent an accidental nuclear war. Uh, so we do that. As far as UAPs, if it deals with a sensor system that is extremely sensitive, that would be used to um, monitor uh, the Soviet military uh, advancements, for example, uh, we don't want our adversaries to know what those capabilities are. So I would say we would not uh, tell the Russians that we detected UAPs over your territory. But having said that, uh, it's no secret, it's not classified that there are things known as agents. And these are foreign citizens who we hire in order to spy against their own government. That is what a true agent is. And so assuming that there are agents in our employee, uh, sometimes they tell us what their leadership is concerned about. And that's how we know uh, that you know they are concerned and they have detected it. So there's no need for us to tell them what they already know. And so mm. through other means of collecting uh, intelligence, 
we know that there is a heightened interest in UAPs in Russia. And of course, uh, uh, George Knapp uh, went over there and gathered a lot of documents. I, right. I, what are they called? Thread three documents. I, I, I don't know the no correct nomenclature, but these documents show that there was an interest in the entire subject back during the Soviet era. And so that's the best answer I can give you. I mean, I don't think we needed to tell them what they already knew. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Um, so I'm sure since you left, um, which was in 2009, I'm not sure, but I would guess that there'd be a lot more of these type of things detected. I mean, you have no way of knowing this, right? I, I have no way of knowing it. Um, what I know is what uh, was released in the preliminary assessment, the unclassified preliminary assessment that was uh, actually put together in a hurry uh, for their public consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it was so poorly written, in my opinion. Uh, CIA officer did not write that because we wouldn't write that poorly. Um, <laughs> it's just a little, a little mm -hmm. dab at the Department of Defense. Um, but uh, there were like 144 objects under study by the UAP task force, of which one was a balloon, and three of them uh, must have been Tech Tech, Go Fast, and Gimbal. So that leaves 140 unknowns. And they did have the other category, and I don't know what's in the other category, but obviously there's been a lot more detection of these uh, objects uh, in recent years. And I, I would think that there have been more detections all the time. It's just that in the 90s, we finally had the uh, technical means to actually do something called multispectral uh, multi uh, intelligence, multispectral sensors that saw four color bands of IR. Now you have hyperspectral as eight or more. And because we improved our sensor capabilities, um, then we were able to more accurately discern what was in our, our space. And that's mm -hmm. what started the interest in these objects, these orbs that were not like metallic saucers. Now you would say, okay, uh, why, why were they interested in orbs, right? Because maybe we have vehicles that were exploited hidden in some hangar somewhere in the desert. So why would the orbs be such a big deal, right? But it's a big deal because it's exactly what we did have, you know? Let's say we did have uh, other craft that was uh, a metallic type of craft, a structured metallic craft. Perhaps it uses some exotic propulsion technology or whatever, but maybe that's what we knew about, okay? But when these orbs showed up, uh, it completely threw everyone for a loop because these weren't the saucers or the triangles or you name the shape that we knew about. All of a sudden there's these energy orbs and why are they here? Why are we detecting them? And why are they flying, to use uh, the lack of a better term, fly uh, in space, in our skies, in some type of controlled fashion? What is that all about? And that's what started the interest in the orbs and eventually culminated in the working group that then ensued, that when their job was finished, that's Title 50, the civilian side of the intelligence community, Title 50, Title 10, as Lou would tell you, is the Department of Defense Uniform Services side. And then Title 10 was ALSAP. That went over to ALSAP, and they, they expanded their UFO study in terms of what the Department of Defense really understands, and that is uh, threats. Threats to mm -hmm. our warfighters and also weapons uh, that may be uh, arrayed against our warfighters. So... You know, the W in ALSAT stands for weapon, and the T in ATIP stands for threat. And that's mm -hmm. how the Department of Defense approaches things. But on the civilian side, we just wanted to know what the hell were they, how do they work, and why are they here? Um, and, and that's the focus of what the ORB working group did. And that information was then, I believe, tossed over uh, to ALSAP. I, I can't believe that ALSAP, and James Lakatsky did not know about that orb working group that preceded his ALSAP uh, just by a few years. That must have been in the body of knowledge that ALSAP was able to access. Why do you think there, th that's really fascinating. Why do you think there's more, um, it seems to me, 
as far as we know, there's more encounters when it comes to the Navy than there is with the Air Force. And unless I'm getting that wrong, I believe that's that's what we know about. Well, let's go back in history. Uh, let's go back to uh, 1946, January 1st, 1946. Uh, Truman established the National Intelligence Authority, under which was established the Central Intelligence Group, CIG. And at that time, the oldest intelligence organization in the U.S. government was the Office of Naval Intelligence. And now we have the newcomers, the Central Intelligence Group. And then there was no Department of Defense. There was no Air Force. It was the Department of the Army. And they had something called the G2, which was their intelligence person, a, a, a very senior general. And so when uh, Roswell happened, you had the Navy, uh, the CIG, which became the CIA. And at that time, uh, Department of War was in some amorphous state because the Defense Department didn't get established until 1949. In 1947, uh, when uh, the National Security Act was signed, it was called the National Military Establishment. So the real intelligence outfits were CIG with its lineage to OSS, and you had the Office of Naval Intelligence working together. And so that's why the Navy has been involved from the get-go. Uh, as we proceed forward, it became known that some of these craft, these structured metallic craft, had undersea capabilities and that mm. they were being detected under the sea. Now, OK, why is that? Well, does the Air Force have nuclear weapons in 1947? Yes, they did. But mm. it was the Department of Army's gravity, dri gravity drop atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1950s, before we built uh, ballistic missiles, uh, we we also had nuclear-powered ships, and we also had uh, nuclear-powered submarines, and we also had ballistic missiles, along with the Air Force's uh, early ballistic missiles carrying nuclear warheads. But the Navy has been there from the very beginning because of their history with the phenomenon as structured craft under the sea. And the fact mm. that, you know, I mean, Gee whiz, uh, the, these, these aircraft carriers and these ships are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. I have to be very careful. The Navy <laughs> likes for me to say capable of, not that they are. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these cruise missiles that are launched, uh, they could easily have a nuclear warhead in a strategic mode. But usually what you see is the tactical warhead. So the, the Navy has a lot of nuclear capability. And that's why they might be interested in what's under the sea. And that's why maybe submarines are able to detect them under the sea. Well, we hear mm. from the Air Force, a uh, craft like that hovered over Maelstrom on March 16, 1967, that mm. hovered over Maelstrom. And so because of, again, there was a nuclear Minuteman II missiles uh, in those two launch control centers. So I think mm -hmm. that's the reason why the Navy has been involved in it. It's just that the ocean is an easy place to hide. We mm -hmm. haven't mapped a lot of it. And if you want to hide something, I would put it in the ocean. And if these non-human intelligence beings would want to hide from us, I would go under the water. Yeah, it, it is pretty amazing when you hear about what they call them, fast walkers or fast movers or whatever they are. Uh, the capabilities of whatever it is that they've caught on radar, sometimes, uh, you know, 200 knots, which is crazy to think about the displacement, how they could move that fast. And uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, Lou Elizondo a few times, as he talks about the uh, intermedia travel, uh, it just seems bizarre that there's no sonic booms, there's no... Uh, you know, there's no like splashes. People don't talk about splashes and things like that. I mean, it or uh, the movement underwater is just at crazy speeds. Yeah. It's really quite amazing. I know I know there are torpedoes that can go that fast under the water. And in mm. fact, they actually repel some of the water ahead of the torpedo, which is why they can like basically fly under the water. Uh, they're flying in air under the water because of the repelling factor in front of the torpedo. So 200 knot torpedo is not science fiction. There are oh. there are uh, ASW or anti-submarine warfare 
weapons that can go that fast under the water. Oh, how about that? And have how long have those been known to exist? Uh, that's a fairly old technology. I mean, uh, believe me, it takes it takes a long time to bring a weapon system into what we call initial operating capability or IOC. It takes mm. like sometimes decades <laughs> to work uh -huh. on a weapon system. By the time it goes to IOC, uh, it, it's almost like ready to be replaced uh, with another weapon that will take <laughs> another 10 years. Oh, um, so, funny. you know, it, yeah. that that ASW capability has been around for a long time, as well as uh, I would address this uh, non-acoustic ASW detection. That is non-sonar anti-submarine warfare detection. And so that's an area that the Navy considers to be extremely sensitive. And I can't address it other than to say that there are ways to detect objects under the ocean without the use of sonar. And I'll leave it at that. And so if mm. you're wondering how the Navy can find these things, or maybe if the Navy detected these things, uh, it's non-acoustic ASW. And that's something that I say, Wikipedia is your friend. Just wiki non-acoustic <laughs> ASW, and you can read all about it. I wonder if anyone ever puts up classified stuff up there yes. anonymously. They do. I've read <laughs> what I would think that needed to be portion marked, at least confidential secret in some of these Wikipedia articles. Yeah, because you, you can kind of remain anonymous when you're posting things uh, in a roundabout way, I imagine. So, yeah, that... Uh, they, but they could probably, the government, I'm sure, could figure it out if they wanted to track someone down. Here's an interesting question. If you were released from all NDAs, do you have information you are currently unable to share that you believe would radically change the general population skepticism of the UAP UFO phenomena? Uh, without saying what that might be, my answer is yes. As I mm -hmm. said before, I, I do know something that I did share uh, with people authorized to receive that information in a secure location. And they concurred that they also know this information as well. So I wasn't telling them anything new. What that information might be, I can't talk about. But it would, well, it would change I, your I perspective. Sort of got this, I sort of got the same answer or a similar answer from Lou Elizondo when I asked, I asked him that question. So, yeah, and it's kind of like <laughs> we really would love to know but I, I totally understand how much trouble you would get in and also uh, he would get in. And, uh, you know, so you just have to you have to think about all that before you, you know, you don't want to end up in jail. I don't know what I don't know what the penalties are. If you disclose something, you lose your pension. Well, uh, what it would be is a all expense paid vacation to the Allenwood Federal Correction Unit in Pennsylvania. And I don't want to go there. <laughs> so yeah. that's what it would be and it'll probably be for 20 years oh isn't that something wow uh let's see uh here's another question by the same person did the orbs have a defined spherical surface or were they just bright objects uh, i would say that they were spherical uh whether there's something solid underneath the uh, 600 nanometer light around it that was shining from it uh, i don't know I don't know if we were able to discern anything solid. I would say that it was a, a circular spherical uh, uh, objects uh, and the, the they were able to measure the radiance, the how bright it was. Um, and they were able to measure where in the color spectrum, where in the electro optical spectrum it fell. And it was 600 nanometers, which is uh, orange red. So are you you're basically answering this question? How does an orb show up? on instruments or visually differently from, say, a metallic? You more or less just answered that question, right? Yeah, well, the metallic sphere would reflect uh, electromagnetic energy, uh, radar, radar uh, wave, uh, waveforms. So, you know, you shine, mm -hmm. uh, you paint it, as we say, we paint the object with a radar beam, and you might get some reflection back from it. Uh, so that's how you know that there's something metallic, something that is able to reflect electromagnetic energy. Uh, having said that, that sometimes if you have a plasma field around that type of object, you will not get that deflection back, the reflection back um, in a way that you can see it, but you won't be able to like track it with radar. There are ways to track these things using passive coherent location, PCL. That's another thing that Wikipedia is your friend. 
you can look at <laughs> passive coherent location or passive radar where mm -hmm. uh, I'm of the age that I remember with our uh, TVs with the antenna on the roof uh, that every time a plane would fly over our town that the TV yeah. would go all wonky for a while and that's known as multipath. That plane was reflecting the TV signal, not only the TV signal coming from directly from the transmitter antenna of the station, but the signal reflected off of that plane back to uh, our antenna on the roof. And so if you have yeah. a lot of these receivers with these antennas, if you have something flying through that field of energy, you should get some reflections back. And the more receivers you have, you're able to then triangulate uh, and locate and track where that object might be going. And mm. so uh, that was something of interest to our uh, good friend, Dr. Ronald S. Pandolfi. Um, he was working with uh, Lockheed Martin on a project called Silent Sentry to do just that, to use non-cooperative emitters to be able to track stealthy airborne objects hmm. and to be able to triangulate and correlate that so that you can have a pretty good track of where that object might be and then you can then by doing that you can apply other sensors toward that object to hmm. redefine it a little bit better and that is the context that i met dr pandolfi at a meeting at the defense intelligence agency uh the it's called dia uh, D as in Delta, T as in Tangle, DT. Uh, that's the uh, science and technology side of the DIA. And they they do MAZINT, something known as measurement and signature intelligence. And that whole field is, is considered a subdiscipline of MAZINT. And that was his uh, interest when I uh, when I met him. You know, we I can't believe this. The time has gone by so fast. Of course, I've been out of it for a little bit. But um, we, we only have a minute left. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like I need to get you back on to talk to talk some more. But um, I, I just don't trust this internet to keep going. And uh, one of the one of the uh, questions I wanted to ask you, and I don't mm -hmm. know, you can't really answer it in a minute. But um, don't we have, or would you even know this if we have satellites that would be able to uh, track something coming in toward orbit? Of course. Of course. I, and who has who gets that information? Or well, right now, U.S. Space Force. Space Force. Yeah. yeah. Space situational awareness, and huh. so um, they have. Uh, you know, the Air Force has wings. They have deltas, and so they have a delta for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. They have a delta for orbital warfare, and so they also have a delta for ballistic missile defense. And so the combination of these deltas um, as part of, you know, our space situational awareness, uh, they will be able to detect these types of objects. Uh, by the way, a ballistic missile, when it's launched, it's basically a space rocket. It goes up about 700 miles above the surface of the Earth. Mm. And so that's above where some of our satellites are. Are, are orbiting in low Earth orbit, but we have other satellites that can, are able to detect that, primarily the uh, space-based infrared system, CBERS, um, SBIRS, which replaced the old defense support program, the DSP program. And so these satellites are able to detect objects like that. Hmm, interesting. Well, it went way too quickly, and uh, I apologize for the internet issues. And it's always a, a great pleasure to, to speak with you, John. Yeah, I apologize because uh, there's no such thing as a short answer from me. Um, <laughs> no, no, I uh, love it. So, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. You take care. All right. Bye bye. Bye now. All right, everyone. So, thank you so much. We'll be back next week with Charles Lear. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Mm -hmm.